Tonight, the shell shock bug might be bigger than the heartbeat bug. Why the FBI director is not happy with Apple or Google. And Apple might have known of that iCloud security hole more than six months ago. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 180 for Thursday, September 25th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow. Send files of almost any size easily and securely with Citrix ShareFile. For a 30-day free trial, go to sharefile.com, click the microphone, and enter TN2. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's top story. And joining me now to talk more about it is... The person perfect to talk about this, Steve Gibson, host of Security Now here on the Twit Network. Hey, Steve. Hey, Sarah. Great to be with you. Well, great to have you. And I'm so glad we have you to talk about today because sometimes these crazy security stories can be frightening at the same time a little confounding. So let's talk about this shell shock bug. It is being compared to the heartbeat heart bleed bug that really sent a lot of people into panic earlier this year. What is shell shock and, and how is it unique? Okay, so it's completely different from heart bleed. It's, it's being compared to it only in as much as everybody is currently in a massive frenzy tizzy um, because it is serious. Heart, the way to think of heart bleed is that hackers who tried really, really hard may have been able to exfiltrate some information from a web server. Shell shock is different. What we found, what has just really come to public light in the last 24 hours is that there's been for two decades, from like, like from 1989, I think is when this happened, a, a, a never before discovered bug in, in the bash command interpreter in Unix and Linux systems, and that web sites and, and internet um, servers of different kinds, more than just web servers actually, sometimes use this command interpreter for like to, to perform some work for them, sort of as a utility function. And what was discovered was that it was possible to add a command, an actual like command line thing that the administrator would normally do with complete privileges and after logging on and identifying themselves and so forth, that it was possible for somebody on the internet to append that kind of super powerful command to the end of some other information that they're sending to the server, which would cause the server to execute that super privileged command without any, like like just like on the fly, without any protections and safeguards. How long did so, you say that this vulnerability has been around? It, 20 years. Uh, and, like, and, and and I mean, is it just sort, some sort of a fluke that it is now being discovered? Or a it, very yeah, it, small number of people were the only ones who knew about it? Well, now, it may not have, it may not have been a feature 20 years ago because what's happened is the bash is is the so-called command interpreter that Linux uses. You know, uh, mm -hmm. Windows people have like seen the command line, and you know wh wh where you basically have to be a wizard to like type things. <laughs> and in the old DOS days, that's the way you did things before you had a mouse that you could point and click. Well, this exists now in Linux, and it's super handy. So what's happened is over the years. It's evolved. New features have been added to the point now where it's a it's a scripting language. You can do more than just issue commands. You can write little programs in it. And one of the things that was discovered was that if a function was defined in a in an environment variable, as they're called, and then a command was added to the end, this bash interpreter, like the 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 current state of the art bash interpreter, would would define the function and then but it would keep going it would go past the end of the function and say oh look here's more and it would execute whatever was there okay so this is the sort of thing that you might hear about and say okay well steve's teaching me a thing or two about how these bash functions work but 
is my bank account safe? Is this going okay. to be an easy fix? Like, what do you know? The 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 what does the population at large need to worry about and or change? Okay, so the problem with this is there. It's sort of on several tiers. There's the internet community that is frantically updating Bash right now. That is. Uh, uh, for example, Apache servers have this problem. Half of the internet is running Apache. So uh, there's already an internet worm, which is loose on the internet. There's a distributed denial of service attack that has been based on this. This is only uh, 24 hours old, and there's already worms and DDoS attacks based on this. So this gives you a sense for the the the, the reason people are concerned is that vulnerabilities now have like rating scales, you know, like one to 10. And this is a 10 across the board, ease of attack, ease of development, severity, um, no need for authentication. It's just in every different way this can be measured, this is bad. But the way this affects the regular people like the rest of us is that that Linux has sort of crawled in to our appliances. Linux is in light bulbs. Linux is in our little home routers. Linux is in, you know, pot, computerized pasta machines and washing and you know, washing machines and dryers and it's everywhere. And Bash often is too. This vulnerable component is so handy that it just sort of tags along for the ride. So, for example, webcams often are linux based and they and their and their little web servers they sort of have simple minded web servers written in bash so this vulnerable part is in webcams that's already been we we we've seen in the last 24 hours proof that webcams can be hacked this way so the so called internet of things that more and more of us have pieces of it is very likely vulnerable I, you know, we're only 24 hours in. We don't really have a full grip. I mean, because people are scrambling around and pretty much everywhere they look, they find vulnerable things. So um, for Macs are vulnerable. Macs all have this bash that is vulnerable. Although Mac, the, the typical personal Mac is not exposed to the internet generally. Um, maybe there's a way that that visiting a website could leverage this uh, but I, I know this will get fixed very quickly. All right. So that was going to be my next question. How long should we expect this to take? Obviously, this is a big deal. But as you said, we're really only 24 hours in. People who understand the issues understand that it is major. Then again, Heartbleed got a lot of attention right away. But there were there were websites that had Heartbleed issues many months after they should have right. known better. Right. There, um, and that's the problem is that many of these devices don't have an automatic update cycle. You know, Windows is getting updates. Yeah, our browser the Linux being pasta updated. maker, probably not updated regularly. <laughs> well, <laughs> and also the, 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 the small Soho router, you know, your own home router. Uh, we're not, we don't know that it's vulnerable, but I would say be a little proactive on the things you have that you know connect to the internet check the websites of its of those manufacturers to see whether they have a statement one way or the other about whether it's you should proactively update the firmware on the things that you have some control over which do have access to the internet because right now the internet is being scanned there's massive scanning going on both by white hat and black hat hackers trying to get a, a sense for the scope and scale, and right now trying to get into machines that are internet-facing. Steve Gibson and Leo Laporte will definitely be talking about this next Tuesday when Security Now airs here on Twitter, airs live on Tuesdays at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. Thank you so much, Steve Gibson, host of Security Now and person who helps me understand when I need to panic. Anytime, Sarah. Thanks a lot. Uh, let folks know where they can get a hold of you outside of Security Now, which, by the way, is at twit.tv slash SN. It is, and I'm at grc.com, Gibson Research Corporation, and with a whole bunch of 
uh, stuff, security related and hard disk data recovery related. And coffee. If you um, if you hang out with coffee. Steve long enough, you know that he drinks a lot of coffee. Thanks so much, Steve. See you on Tuesday. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. All right, coming up, why a couple sisters who modeled for Snapchat are now suing the company and some other stories too. But first, let's take a moment to thank ShareFile for sponsoring this episode of Tech News Tonight. Okay, so I'm part of a business here at Twit. We're, we're collaborating. We're, you know, we're a mid-sized team. I got a lot of coworkers. We're sharing things and, and, and spreadsheets and, and there are contracts and sometimes we've got guests and there are photos and videos and all of this stuff is really important. We need to make sure our files are safe, they're secure, they're under our control, they're easy to find. That's why we recommend Citrix ShareFile because it's an easy to use business solution that allows you to exchange files quickly, but also securely is kind of the theme of the show today, security. With Citrix ShareFile, you can send files of almost any size. You won't get bounce backs. You can control who has access to your files. You can control who can make edits You could, uh, and, and, and who can't. Levels of permission, that's always important. And it syncs automatically. So your team always has updated materials across all devices. And that's important too. You can access Citrix ShareFile from your laptop, from a tablet, from your smartphone. Access, edit, share, request files on the go from any of your most beloved machines. Try ShareFile with our special offer. In fact, you can sign up today and receive a 30-day free trial. That's no obligation for you. 30 days free. Just go to sharefile.com. Click on the microphone up at the top of the homepage. You can't miss it. And then enter TN and the number two. That's TN2. Sharefile.com. TN2 is your offer code for that 30-day free trial. And thanks to ShareFile for sponsoring this episode of TN2. Okay, let's get right into today's tech feed stories. Last week, Apple announced that its new mobile OS, iOS 8, would prevent law enforcement from retrieving data stored on a locked phone. The next day, Google said the same of its upcoming Android OS. It's on track to be released later this fall. Well, today, FBI Director James Comey said in a briefing with reporters that he's concerned that both companies are now marketing phones that can't be searched by authorities. Mr. Comey said, quote, what concerns me about this is companies marketing something expressly to allow people to place themselves beyond the law. He also said FBI officials have been in touch with both companies to understand what they're thinking and why they think it makes sense. Hmm. Sounds like something an FBI director would say. Mac Rumors is passing along word from an anonymous source, just one anonymous source, it's quick to point out, that Apple is possibly ready in a Mac Mini update to launch next month, along with a rumored new iPad model, models and OS X Yosemite. The Mac Mini hasn't been updated in almost two years. Some were wondering if it ever would be. Mac Rumors notes that it's a little unclear which processors Apple would put in these new units since next generation Broadwell processors from Intel are not scheduled to be ready until next year. They've had quite a few delays actually and current Haswell processors are no longer top of the line. Speaking of Apple, are you an iCloud user who values your privacy? Yeah, well, you don't, not necessarily an iCloud user, but you probably value your privacy. Well, leaked emails between software developer and security researcher Ibrahim Balik and Apple appear to show that as early as March of this year, Apple knew of a security hole that left the personal data of iCloud users vulnerable. That's months before hundreds of celebrity nude photos that were allegedly stolen from iCloud servers ended up surfacing on the internet. Balik's emails, which have been published by Daily Dot, inform Apple of a method that he discovered for infiltrating iCloud accounts by bypassing a security feature designed to prevent brute force attacks. That's a method to crack passwords by trying lots and lots and lots and lots of key combinations, thousands of them. Usually a company will shut you down after about 10 failed attempts though. Balak told Apple he was able to try over 20,000 password combinations on a single account and claims that he was in contact with representatives, but a fix was never made. Back in June of last year, Bollock says he identified a security flaw in the Apple Developer Center, but that his report received no response from Apple. And then in a press release issued a few days later, the company described a security threat and claimed that an intruder attempted to secure personal information of registered developers. Hmm. Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba clicked kicked off its initial public offering, clicked too, last Friday. And Yahoo, which is a major shareholder of Alibaba stock, is already suffering. 
Why? Well, RBC Capital Markets' Mark Mahaney is the third analyst to have downgraded the stock and said today that, quote, over the past year and a half, shares of Yahoo have dramatically outperformed the market, up 97% versus the S&P 500, up 40%. Given the anticipation of the Alibaba IPO, we believe this outperformance has been justified. However, with the Alibaba catalyst behind us, we see upside as limited from here. Yahoo sold part of its stake in Alibaba on IPO day, but still owns about 400 million shares, a stake worth about $35.8 billion before taxes. Yahoo said in a filing on Wednesday that it agreed not to sell those shares for at least one year after the IPO. Drones are going Hollywood, everybody. The Federal Aviation Administration announced today that it has granted regulatory exemptions to six aerial photo and video production companies and that this is the first step to allowing the film and television industry the use of unmanned aircraft systems, or UAS, in the national airspace system. The FAA previously had banned the commercial use of drones across the board, although the agency has been under pressure from the Motion Picture Association of America to make exemptions. And a number of companies also want to operate drones commercially, like Amazon and Google. Well, finally, Snapchat just can't seem to shake the lawsuits. After settling with its uh, co-founder, ousted co-founder Reggie Brown, for an undisclosed sum just a few weeks ago, two sisters, Sarah and Elizabeth Turner, originally had modeled for Snapchat's first app called Peekaboo. In fact... You might recognize them. I did right away because they're on lots of sort of promotional materials for Snapchat when you first sign up, that sort of thing. They are suing CEO Evan Spiegel and Snapchat CEO Bobby Murphy, CTO rather, Bobby Murphy, claiming that they never got paid for their work. Not only that, but the sisters claim the tawdry nature of Snapchat's current app has caused them damage if you search for unsavory terms in Google, for example. Sometimes their images pop up to the top of the list. The women are arguing that because they agreed only to release their photos for iPhone promotion and that their photos have also now been used in Android and website promotions, that they should be compensated because their faces, their lovely ladies, helped Snapchat soar to its current valuation, which is around $10 billion. However, in documents of the model releases signed by both sisters and obtained by Business Insider, the form stated that the sisters would not be compensated for their work. Who will win? I don't know yet, but we'll find out soon. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show, twit.tv slash TN2 is the place to go for all our show notes and those subscription links. You can uh, email us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And Tech News Today is our morning show that airs tomorrow, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.